start by thanking you all for coming here today um, in what promises to be a nice, bright, sunny day to hear about cold, cold things, but really cool materials. <laughs> so we have one goal for this um, um, Science uh, Saturday today, and that is uh, we want to talk to you about science, we want to inspire you, and we want to get you hooked on science without you actually realizing it's happening. <laughs> Well, the challenge that we have is very simple. We want to talk about superconductors, which are actually some of the most complicated materials uh, with respect to science and with respect to physics. So our challenge is to be able to explain these materials to you without the assumption that you know anything about physics, which you probably do. Mike, the mic is only for the video. <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> yes. So. Can you hear me everywhere? Yes, sir. Yes? yes? Great. So let me, uh, let me introduce the team to you. So um, we've got, uh, among the presenters, we've got Mike Coffey, who is the CEO of a company here called Cryomagnetics. They make products with what you will learn about low temperature superconductors. Very fascinating. You're going to hear from Athena Safasafat and Thomas Meyer, who are young scientists at ORNL, the rising stars. I'm also at ORNL, the Oak Ridge National Lab. Then you're going to experience, uh, you're going to do some student projects. And we thank all the volunteers who are going to help with that. And in particular, I'd like to thank uh, Perance, who has agreed to take the lead in working with all volunteers who may come, parents and otherwise. I'd like to thank uh, Gene Ice, who is going to demonstrate to you. and. Very fascinating, using the cryogen that we use to cool superconductors, make instant ice cream. And then you, I also want to thank Frank Wood. He is a science teacher at the Oak Ridge High School, and we've interacted with him. Very dedicated teacher. It's great if you have teachers like that in, in high schools. OK, so with that, let me, let me move on. So here are the outline of what you're going to see today. I'll start to give you an introduction to these materials. And in doing so, we will invoke artists, we'll invoke dance, we will invoke fast trains, and the like. Then you'll do this hands-on project, where you will actually levitate and suspend in mid-air a magnet or a superconductor. Then you'll come back here. This will be done at the cafeteria in the high school which is a short walk from this room. Then you'll come back here, and you will get to see, which you cannot appreciate now, but you will in a few minutes, something called an R versus T, or resistance versus temperature demonstration, done live right here on the stage. And that would be done by Mike Coffey, and he's going to talk about his company and all the fascinating things that they are doing right here in, in the Tennessee area. Athena is then going to come along and talk about new superconductors, superconductors that we don't actually know are superconductors, or materials that we don't know are superconductors right now. And as you will learn, that the theory of how some of these interesting, complicated materials work is not known. And Thomas Meyer is going to talk about that. And then, of course, the most important thing, the ice cream with liquid nitrogen. And the time for that, as you can see here, goes on until it's over. <laughs> All right, so let, let, let me start on high temperature superconductors. I'm going to talk about, give you sort of a, take you on a journey from the discovery to the applications of these materials. So if you ask the question, what is superconductivity? A good way to find that out is to go to the dictionary, right? So if you went to the Webster's Dictionary before 1987, it would tell you that it is a phenomenon exhibited by certain metals and alloys of continuously conducting electrical current without resistance when cooled to temperatures near absolute zero. I'll talk about what absolute zero is in a bit. And since 1987, the, dic the dictionary definition has changed. And this is going to sound rather complicated to you right now, but it shouldn't after a few minutes, 10 minutes or so. Zero resistance. It's something that's characterized by zero resistance, perfect diamagnetism, and I know the buzzword, quantum, right? Long range quantum mechanical order. All right, so what is cold? So you're looking at a chart here in Kelvin, centigrade, and Fahrenheit. 
So boiling water is 100 degrees centigrade or 373 Kelvin. Ice is zero degrees or 273 Kelvin. Absolute zero is down here. It's zero Kelvin. And this is where we're going to demarcate between high and low temperature superconductors. So around here is where the low temperature superconductors operated. The high temperatures operate near a cryogen called liquid nitrogen, which is the cost of liquid nitrogen is about the same as the price of mineral water. And so, so you, can, you can understand why there would be excitement if somebody could come within this regime. So superconductivity was discovered in 1911 by a Dutch scientist called Camelin Owens. He took some mercury and he cooled it down. And when he cooled it down, to his surprise, the amount of current or amount of resistance that, a mercury, that the mercury sample would have as a function of temperature just nosedived to zero. This step transition from a finite resistance to a zero resistance was named superconductivity, this phenomenon. Since this discovery in 1911, which is 100 years ago, many new materials have been found to be superconducting. But the slope of the temperature at which they would undergo this transition as a function of time is rather shallow. And you know, for 80 years, the temperature just went up to 20 Kelvin, which is actually very low temperature. So then in 1986, these two guys from, from IBM Zurich, Alex Mueller and Bednos, they discovered or they reported a material that they claimed was superconducting. But you see these guys, you see the serious look on their faces? They were really serious about it. Not because, I think they were serious because they didn't know whether it was real or not. You know, they published this in an obscure journal. Well, but apparently, it was correct. Many people around the world confirmed it, even though it was published in an obscure journal. And then people started working with whole families of superconductors. And quickly, this transition temperature, or the temperature at which this material undergoes a superconducting transition, went <laughs> skyrocketing up, all the way up to 150, where there's a certain kind of superconductor, a mercury-based superconductor. But even though all these superconductors were discovered, there is one superconductor called the yttrium barium copper oxide superconductor, which is very promising for applications because it has some intrinsic properties which are very good. Now, this time was a really exciting time for physics. It was, uh, if you're a self-respecting scientist, or if you've got a PhD in science or engineering in any area, you had to be working in superconductivity in 1987 when all of this was going on. There were reports of room temperature superconductors every day. But there was only one report that came out in the New York Times in October of 1989, which is true. All the other reports, we call them as UFOs, unidentified superconducting objects, because they were not real. They were all false reports. And this report, which is true, happened to be of a symphony conductor, which was true. I mean, you know. So besides symphony, Superconductivity and music have other connections. Trivia question, what do rock and roll and superconductivity have in common? Anybody? No. So, have you heard about the Woodstock of music? No. I don't expect you to. That was in 1969, right? So this was a time when rock and roll was popular. There were 400,000 people. 30 to 40 bands went on for three days. It had a major impression on the culture of this nation and the world, really. <laughs> but the com commonality is that superconductivity is the only topic in physics and science which had what we, you would call a Woodstock of physics. So when these materials were discovered in 1987, when the Nobel Prize was given, there was a great deal of excitement about these materials. As I mentioned, everybody was working on this. And so there was a session in. Uh, in a conference in 1987 held in New York City, where even in the most happening nightclubs, there was a nightclub called Limelight in New York City back then, they were very interested in physicists to come in and you know, enter the nightclub. You know? There was a special announcement that came out. So in 1987, there was a Nobel Prize given to
to Bednarz and Mueller. When they heard they got the Nobel Prize, these are the same guys who were really serious in the picture that I showed you previously, right? They were very happy. They had to be happy, right? It was a great, it was a great discovery. Every newspaper and magazine speculated on how these materials would change the world we live in. So you see all these ads coming out. They don't have to be scientific journals. Every newspaper magazine was talking about that. So what are the properties of superconductors? As I mentioned, when you take a superconductor and you cool it down in temperature and you keep measuring its, its resistance, that is the resistance to electrical current flow, you find that at a certain temperature, the resistance vanishes. And that is called the transition temperature. For these materials, it was above liquid nitrogen temperatures close to 90 Kelvin. Another property of superconductors is that when you have these magnetic flux lines, if you have two magnets, the magnetic flux lines that go from one pole to the other, these are these invisible lines. And if you put a superconductor within them, as long as it's above its transition temperature, nothing happens. But as you go below the transition temperature, the superconductor doesn't like these lines and this expels them out. So it behaves like a dye magnet. And this dye magnet or dye magnetism is what results in this levitation. This is a superconductor cooled to liquid nitrogen below this transition temperature and you put a permanent magnet near it, it expels the flux lines and makes the magnet levitate. And you're actually going to do this experiment. So a fair question is what causes superconductivity? And so let me, let me remind you that electrical current is carried by electrons. Have you heard of electrons? Excellent. So the electrons are particles which in a metal, any metal like copper, can be envisaged as, as built up of, of an array of positive ions. right? And there's something called electrons which, which flood it around like a sea. And electrical current is carried by these particles called electrons, which are negatively charged, as opposed to these positively charged atoms, which sit or comprise any um, metal. So resistance occurs when these electrons interact with a defect in, in the metal. Or if these positive ions are vibrating, if, it, if the electron interacts with that, it results in resistance. And this is manifested as heat. So the material gets hot. It took physicists 50 years from the discovery, all around the world really, 50 years from the discovery of superconductivity in 1911 to first explain the mechanism of low temperature superconductors. And you can ask why. And part of the reason is that I mentioned to you that electrons are negatively charged. So they should repel each other. And the theory that was needed required that the electrons be bound together in pairs. The question is, what would keep these two things, which should, should repel each other, at basically in a pair? And the answer was the so-called BCS theory. There are three scientists who, who discovered this. And it's called a Cooper pair, a two electrons that form together, uh, which form a pair. And so the way to understand this is like this. If you had a mattress that was soft, and you had two people, right? If one person gets on the mattress and the other person tries to get on it, this person will be attracted towards the depression created by the first person if the mattress was soft, right? But we know that these electrons are supposed to not like each other. So they should kind of go away from each other, right? So if you now say that, hey, these guys don't like each other, so there's only one of them there in the mattress at any given time. And when that person gets away, the other person comes before the mattress goes back to its original state, then the second person will go back to the same hole that was created by the first person. So even though these two people don't like each other, they were connected by the mattress. And the squishiness of this mattress is what controls what's called the energy gap, and hence the superconducting properties. So the way to look at it is, as I mentioned to you before, a metal can be thought of as atoms with positive ions and a sea of electrons. So if you had an electron, just sort of go through this lattice here, right? As it goes through, because it's negatively charged, 
it'll attract these positive guys here towards it. And when that happens, the lattice tends to relax back to its original state. But before it does that, if another electron stops by, it sees a more concentrated positive charge here. And because of that, it's attracted to that area. So hence, these two electrons are connected to each other in the form of a Cooper pair. And this doesn't happen to only two electrons. It happens to all the electrons in this body. So they're correlated. So what that means is, if you know a state of electrons in one part of the superconductor, you know it in another part. So the way to look at this so-called long-range quantum mechanical order is that this is when electrons are paired in a correlated fashion. What does that mean? If you had a, if you had a motorcycle or if you had a car with just one wheel and it was going through this rough uh, road with all these rocks on it, if you had just one wheel, it would just come and hit a rock and stop. But if you had a car with a very wide wheelbase with independent suspension, then this truck with correlated wheels will actually travel relatively smoothly through the lattice. And that's how the supercurrent travels within this material. So a better way to understand this is the Nobel Prize of 1972. So this BCS theory in 1957 got a Nobel Prize to the three scientists who discovered this, um, this mechanism after 50 years of the discovery of superconductivity. And a very good way to understand what is happening is to talk to an artist, in this case, a choreographer in Berkeley. And you're going to see a dance called Currents. No sound. You didn't do anything, no? <laughs> OK, let's see what's happening. Let's try it again. the wire. Let's try it again. OK, so we don't have the main sound system working. So we're going to try this. No, it's not working before. Well, the volume is up. So Let me try one thing, OK? OK, sure. Yep, done. Excellent, Athena. It's done. With superconductivity in the movies, another theorist wondered how to explain the superflow of electrons to an interested public. It's hard to think of electrons without having some picture in your mind. And so I mentioned to people who did not have a OK, so what you're going to see is uh, there's, there's a choreographer called David Wood. He's going to actually explain to you the Cooper pair dance, how actually currents flow in a superconductor using a dance. So he's going to put obstacles in the floor. And you're going to see, first see dancers come in in an uncorrelated fashion, just like electrons in, in, a, in a solid. right? And they'll kind of bounce around with these obstacles and all that. And then, then he's going to see. Uh, you're going to see dancers working in a correlated fashion, and then I'll explain to you what's going on. So these are the obstacles.
Can you hear the back? No? So now the electrons are getting paired. You'll see two dancers doing exactly opposite moves, but in a correlated fashion. So in real world, what that means is these electrons have opposite spins. You don't worry about what the spins are. Just concentrate on the dancers. They're doing opposite moves. So what happens is, as they encounter a defect, if one person is doing one thing and the other person is doing the opposite thing, they conserve momentum. And that's the reason why there's no resistance. So, so here's the thing. So you're looking at an explanation for all superconductors, which were superconducting at lower temperatures. The problem with this theory now for the new superconductors, which operate at 77 Kelvin or higher, is that at these high temperatures, atoms move. Because the temperature is high, they kind of move around everywhere, right? Because the atoms move, it's very difficult for this lattice, before they were connected through this mattress analogy, through these positive ions that I told you. So there's an electron phonon, it's called, you know, these lattice vibrations are called phonons. That was coupling the two electrons together. With these high temperature superconductors, these vibrations are too rapid to allow that pairing to occur. So some other mechanism occurs. And you're going to hear more about that from Thomas later on. OK, so let's go now to applications. So I've told you a little bit about what superconductors are. I've told you a little bit about how they might work. Now the question is, what can you do with them, right? So here's a, what we call a superconducting tree for applications. So you've got this technology here. You've got electric power applications, like you can have, um, as I'll show to you, cables which can carry very, very large amounts of current over long distances. You can talk about levitating trains. You can talk about MRI scans. Those require very high superconducting magnets. So there are a whole variety of applications in medicine, in energy conservation physics, electric power, transportation, and electronics. And most of these applications, you need a wire. And most of these applications in any one of these branches could be in billions of dollars. But for all of these applications, except the electronics applications in this branch, you need to have a long wire, much like a copper wire that you buy in a hardware store. So a question to ask is, why do we need superconductors for all these applications? So how many of you are familiar with this cartoon character called Dilbert? Wow, I'm impressed. So he's a wise guy. So it's always good to ask him these questions. He would say, because resistance is futile. That's actually an excellent answer. It is an excellent answer. But you can, you can expand on that answer. You can't do better than that, you, because you can save energy, because your products will be more compact, environmentally friendly, and then they, you can get into more details of niche applications. So let's talk about electric power applications. You know, the electric grid is far bigger than the tele telecommunications industry or the, the size of that, of that industry. And you have things like cables that you see near the highway. You can store energy in what's called a rotating superconductor, as you will see when you do these experiments that if you have levitation going on, this thing could just go on forever with the current flowing in it without resistance. You can make motors, generators, all kinds of materials. Very large applications are possible. So I mentioned to you about levitating trains, and you'd ask, levitating trains really? So let's see a video on that. And the volume is a little low because the sound system in this auditorium is not exactly working, but we'll just have to do with it. Thank you. 
think this is better. Well, So the superconductor is suspended, and you will do this experiment, not exactly this, but something similar to it. So, so that video was made by um, IFW, it's a research institution in Dresden, Germany. Um, so l let me just tell you what these materials look like. You probably are wondering, what do these materials really look like, right? So they're rather complicated materials. And if you have, have you learned about atoms? Yes, you have, right? So a simple a model of, an, of, a, of a solid is you've got atoms in equal distances in all three dimensions, right? In this case, you've got different atoms that come in, and in fact, the, the reason why these materials superconduct is because we've got these red planes, which are really made of just copper and oxygen, and they are the superconducting planes, and in between them, we've got all these other materials like strontium and calcium and barium. Um, these are all what we call insulating materials. In fact, they don't really do too much for superconductivity, but these two-dimensional planes are the important ones. And we've got two, two different families of superconductors. In fact, we've got more than that. But two commonly studied ones are ones with the yttrium based and one which have bismuth in them. And the big difference between the two is these are like mica-like. So if you were to take this 
this uh, bismuth-based superconductor, and you were to press it down hard, it would do the same thing that a misaligned deck of cards would do. In other words, it'll all kind of lay down nice flat on a flat surface. Um, these ones, on the other hand, they are like your glasses. You know, a, a glass which is made of a ceramic material, which is glass, and you kind of drop it down, it kind of breaks. And you try to press on it, it just cracks. So these are mica-like. So the first superconducting wires of this material were made with this mica-like material because you could deform it and it just kind of move like a deck of cards. And so companies formed worldwide to make those materials. Uh, let me just tell you about them. So if you take a look at the superconductor under a microscope, it will look like mud or dirt on your flower bed. So the goal is to be able to take this and make it into a long wire. So the problem with a wire which has particles like this is that when you pass the current, electrical current, divided by the area, the diameter, the area of the wire, as a function of magnetic field, you know, you get a very low value. It's 1,000 here. What you really need is a million here. And it just drops when you apply a small magnetic field. And as you will learn, with a little bit of magnetic field, you need for most applications. And so the big problem for this is because these grains are not aligned with respect to each other. And they have crud at the interfaces. So how do you do this? So companies formed worldwide because using this process. What they did was they took a silver tube, because silver doesn't react with these superconductors, filled the tube with superconducting powder, and you know just extruded it from a pair of dyes and rolled it into a tape and heat treated it in a furnace. And these are the tapes that would result. This is a silver tape, silver on both sides, superconductor in the middle. And companies formed worldwide, many companies, to make these tapes. But the big problem with these tapes was that if you pass a current through this tape, divided by the cross-section of the tape, which is on the y-axis, and the magnetic field is on the x-axis, the green curve corresponds to some of the best tapes made that way. They only carry 50,000 amps per centimeter squared, and the performance drops the minute you apply a small field. So what you really needed was the blue curve which could carry a lot more current, a few orders of magnitude more current, but remain constant much for much higher applied fields if you want many of the applications that I mentioned to you about. So what the market needs were that we needed a wire which could carry many millions of amps per centimeter squared, but all of this, I mentioned copper in the hardware store. The cost of this wire had to compete with the cost of copper that you buy in your hardware store. And so what that means technically for this wire was that much like the heart of every computer is a silicon chip, which is a single crystal, meaning all the atoms are ordered in all directions. Silicon, as you know, is the most studied electronic material. Even today, the maximum bool of a silicon crystal that you can grow in crystal growth is about 18 inches in diameter and about a few meters long. That's all you can do. Here we wanted to make for all of this to work for high temperature superconductors, a single crystal in my long lens, which is flexible, but had to be made at the price of copper. So there was work done at Oak Ridge National Lab to actually create a process that was termed rabbits to actually make a wire like this. And this process is called really an aluminum foil process. So just like the aluminum foil that you use in the kitchen, this process Make, uses a slightly different metal than aluminum, but makes this metal out into a sheet just like aluminum foil. But this foil is essentially a single crystal. And then in this process, we deposit layers on top of this foil so that the atoms in those layers adopt the same orientation as the atoms in the metal. And so here is the metal that is being rolled in, in a clean room environment because you don't want any dust on there. And that's what it looks like, as I mentioned, just like aluminum foil. And then we take this, and you know, we're putting it through certain systems. There's a, there's a spool of the metal here. It goes like this and comes out here. We heat the tape in some locations. We deposit some materials on it over here. And what we're really doing is, if you look at the metal tape, here, here are the atoms of the metal tape by the, gray, by the gray atoms. And we put some red atoms on every called the sulfur atoms and every other unit cell. 
And if you want to deposit this material, which has these green atoms and these other atoms in there, we kind of deposit it layer by layer so that all the atoms are always correlated. So, so let me move on. So what we're really doing is we have this nickel tape instead of aluminum. We deposit some layers, and then we deposit the superconductor. And when we do that, we get a material which is really good. So I mentioned to you about this, tape, about this plot previously that the first kind of wire within the silver that we were talking about did not have very good current carrying ability. In fact, materials made this way have exactly the same properties as the plot that I showed you previously. And so this wire is now being made um, by um, American Superconductor, which is one of the largest superconductor companies in the world. And they have licensed this technology from Oak Ridge. Now, this is exactly the kind of work that you all can come if you were to get into a science career and create processes like this, discover new materials, and make or realize a technology going forward. So American Superconductor has a metal tape, some layers, and then the superconductor. Here are some pictures from their factory. This is very large factories that they make these wires. They make a wide wire, and they mechanically cut it to the tape that they want for various applications. So that was the first holy grail, if you want to call it, for superconductivity after the discovery of superconductors for realizing applications. But that wasn't enough. There was yet another one, which, which was explained like this. So all useful superconductors are like Swiss cheese. So Swiss cheese has holes in it, right? And many good Swiss cheese, you know, the holes are aligned. So if you think of a superconductor where there's Swiss cheese with aligned holes, instead of the holes, you put in magnetic lines that you can't see. So all useful superconductors have these yellow lines just like Swiss cheese. If you were to take one of these lines and put it over here, and the magnetic field is going in one direction, and if I want to pass a current in one direction like this, then you may or may not have learned this, but there's a law in, in um, um, electromagnetism that you will learn if, in case you haven't learned, that is if the field is in one direction and a current is in another direction, then this magnetic field line has a force going in a perpendicular direction. It's called the right-hand rule. And the point is when this line moves because of this force, it destroys superconductivity and causes resistance to appear and this can manifest itself as heat. So in order to realize applications, we have to immobilize all these yellow lines. So how do you do that? So one way to do that is you take a crystal and you bombard it with something so that those particles go through the crystal and completely make the material non-superconducting. When that happens and you apply a field parallel to these defects, these defects trap the flux line, or this magnetic line, and it can't move. It, when that happens, the amount of current you can pass, this is the amount of current you can pass per unit cross-section, suddenly spikes up. So the question is, how do you do this in a kilometer long wire without adding cost? So this became a big challenge in the field. So again, at Oak Ridge, there was some work done which allowed us to create these defects in certain directions within a superconductor. These lines represent a superconductor that you're seeing here. This is a transmission electron microscope image magnified many, many thousands uh, or 10,000 times, actually 100,000 times. And if you look down these red arrows, you can start to see that the superconductor starts to look like a Swiss cheese microstructure, like the holes that I was talking about, right? So the point is, when you have these um, defects in these superconductors, in these long wires, and now you plot the amount of current you can carry on the y-axis as a function of field, all these various applications, like motors and you know, military applications and planes, generators, cables that I was talking about, these all can be realized because the performance in magnetic fields is now good. So another superconductor company called Superpower, which is the second largest superconductor company uh, in the United States, is making kilometer long wires with these nanoscale defects in them. And again, this is something that you all can actually do things like this if you 
when you take on a problem, the only thing that you're limited by is what you come up with, right? So uh, these are some of the first examples of scaled up nanotechnology in high tech applications. So let me just briefly talk about some markets and applications and finish up. So electricity, the y-axis here is the amount of electricity usage as a function of total energy with the number of years. You can see that there's so many products that use electricity, and it's only going to increase. So wherever you have electricity involved, you can have potential applications of superconductors because they have no resistance, right? So Superpower, uh, one of the companies, this is what they have come up with as their product portfolio. They're working in the space of energy, defense, transportation, medical. And you know they're color coded. Maybe you can't see that, but some of these green ones are near term, like generators, induction heaters, and current leads. The others are midterm and then longer term. So uh, let me show you uh, this uh, picture here. There's a company called Southwire. It is located near Atlanta. It makes, you know, when you drive around the highway, you see these overhead transmission cables. This is the largest company in the United States making overhead transmission cable. All, they have a very large factory in South, near Southwire, uh, near Atlanta, and all the power in this big plant goes through three superconducting cables, as shown here. And this has been operating since 2001. The reason why this has been going on is to just demonstrate that these cables are so stable, or very stable, so that you know, they can be used in larger scale. Here's an example of what's happening in the Albany, New York area. This is actually a cable that you're seeing, underground transmission cable, it, you know, in Albany, New York, connecting two substations, giving power to 25,000 homes. So then you can talk about windmills. You know, in a windmill, you've got this big tower. The, the size of the tower is now fixed. You really can't make them any bigger. So if you want more power, if you substitute a superconducting motor, which is lighter and more efficient, you can double the power output. This is a, a unit of power called megawatts. So that's another application. So I talked about levitated trains, and you're wondering, yeah, that's a nice toy train, but can it actually happen, right? So this is an example. June of last year, 2013, um, Japan, 500 kilometers per hour, faster than the, the conventional bullet train, and you probably want to get inside it, so. Here it is. This is the actual train moving in June of 2013. It gets to 500 kilometers per hour, the people actually sitting inside there, you know? <laughs> 500, was that, how many miles is that? That should be 300? 300, something like, something like 300, yeah. So, so this has still got a long way to go. I mean, but the point is that these trains are, uh, are, are in the pipeline. Of course, another application in Japan, uh, this is a sumo wrestler who, this is several years back, he actually was a sumo wrestling champion, very heavy guy. And the disc is standing and also very heavy. And he's levitated there. And the reason why they did this demonstration is because one of the big applications was that in Japan, people may want to get married while being levitated. But it never, it never took off. I think it wasn't marketed well. Uh, so let me just give you a few more uh, slides and then we need to move on. Here's an example, or this is actually a map of Europe and Asia where superconducting wire is being made. Most of these wires and most of these companies use one of the technologies developed at Oak Ridge National Lab. And so the point, point there is that when you, if you were to choose a career in science, it's very easy to come up with good, innovat good innovative things which may actually find applications somewhere. And here is a map of Europe and Asia where cable is being, uh, you know, big cables which carry very large amounts of current are being uh, worked on. So let's get to your hands-on project. You're going to do, do two projects. One is levitation and one is suspension. In the levitation experiment, you are going to be doing the following things. Um, when, when you get there, you'll have tables. And we want you all to break up into five, six people on each table. There's going to be um, a, a person there who is going to, a, an adult, uh, a uh, scientist, or somebody else who is going to be there with you. 
you will hear about liquid nitrogen, that you can't touch it, from Frankwood, who's just going to come up and tell you what liquid nitrogen can and cannot do. But the point is, we're going to cool the superconductor in liquid nitrogen, and then you'll take the tweezer to pick the magnet, put it on the superconductor, and you'll see it's levitating, and you can actually move it, you can, you can spin it, and all of you get to do that. And then we will do this experiment, which is suspension, where we're going to take a, a superconductor, which has very good uh, defect structures in it. It's called an enhanced flux spinning superconductor. And using this, you'd be able to s use the magnetic fields, which gets spinned in the superconductor, and then you can lift the superconductor out from the liquid nitrogen because it's spinned by these invisible magnetic flux lines. Right? So that's it. And um, how are we doing on time? We're good. Um, ready to One second. Go right uh, yeah, we are ready. Okay, so we're not going to go through this video, but uh, let me introduce Frank Wood. Um, Frank is going to uh, now do a demonstration, uh, talking to you about liquid nitrogen, what liquid nitrogen can do, and about safety, which is very important for this project. Frank. Okay. Uh, thank you for. Uh, hmm? oh, sorry. Thank you for coming. Uh, I, I'm using my teacher voice. I use it every day. Right. Don't I try not to use it at home. Uh, it gets a little bit loud. Um, what we're what I want to talk to you about uh, briefly is about safety before you do your experiment. So we'll do a couple things now. Um, I do have my safety glasses on. I do have my safety glasses on, and you're going to need those too. Uh, and, uh, and in just a moment, you're going to see why, OK? And I'm going to put my gloves on when I get the liquid nitrogen. You're going to need to use the gloves, too. Uh, I'm going to show you a little bit why. Uh, this is a container of liquid nitrogen. OK, well, liquid nitrogen is uh, right around minus 195 degrees centigrade. Um, you know that's a little chillier than it is outside, right? So uh, we have these really nice flowers. They're they're really wonderful. Ma'am, would you like one? Okay, very good. I'm going to improve one here. Uh, I'm going to improve it by. Uh, yeah, I'm going to walk around. Don't worry. Okay, I'm going to improve one of the flowers here. I'm going to dip it into liquid nitrogen. Oh, look, it's kind of steamy. I'll be, I'll be over there in a moment. And it's boiling. Why, why would something boil if it's that cold? Why would something boil? Yes, sir. Well, the point of liquid nitrogen is lower than water. Very good. It's much lower. So the idea is that Liquid water goes from solid to liquid to gas, uh, and uh, um, in, in liquid nitrogen, that goes very quickly. So it's very low. Oh, look, it's pretty. We're going to bring it over here because you guys seem to think that this is pretty nice. Oh, oh, it broke. It broke. Oh, look. Oh, our little flower. <coughs> It broke, okay? This is what will happen to your skin if you put your finger into the liquid nitrogen, okay? Not a very good thing. We still have part of, would you like this? There you go. All right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, so if uh, been requested to take one up to the stage, okay? I also have, uh, I have a balloon. Does anybody in here have hot air? Oh, you do. OK, go ahead and blow that up for me. All right, so I'm going to take the flower. I'm going to take it up to the stage and try. Well, actually, I can go right over here. You broke my balloon? Yeah, OK, well, we're going to pick somebody else. Somebody, you look like you know what you're doing. You don't, you don't know how to blow a balloon? Maybe the gentleman next to you does, OK? Go ahead, blow it up, and put a knot in it, OK? I'm going to go ahead and do this, and I'm going to come over to this side. Boiling again. Yeah, must be really, really low. Oh, 
Wow. Holy mackerel. It's still boiling. That means if it's boiling, that means this is still much hotter than it. What happens when it stops boiling? Does anybody know? I know you do. What about you, Joan? That's right. When they're the same, when the temperature of the flour is the same as the liquid nitrogen, it stops boiling. Okay, here we go. All right, here we go. Oh, look. Oh, since you tried already. You like our rose? We'll just, oh, it has too many. Oh. Would you like to see over here? Oh! That's amazing, isn't it? And the maintenance staff really enjoys this uh, experiment. <laughs> did you get one? Did you get one? Blow? Oh, come on, guys! Holy mackerel! Anyway, here's the big deal. You got to wear your safety glasses. You need to wear these when you're when you're that close to liquid nitrogen. You have to wear protective equipment. Can I request all volunteers and parents who like to volunteer go with to the cafeteria? We, we're looking for adults, please. Only adults. Okay? All right. So, uh, oh, sorry. Okay. Um, now, I want to show you what liquid nitrogen uh, looks like if you spill a little bit. So, I'm going to spill a little bit over here. And I'm just going to, just a little. Okay? Now, is it going to make... What did it do? It just turned immediately into steam, okay? That's what happens. It just turns immediately into steam. I'm going to come over here for you guys, too. Okay? All right, you guys see? Just spill a little bit. It turns immediately into steam. It won't stain it because what happens when it's at room temperature? Well, it's a gas. It's not going to stain the floor, it's a gas, okay? All right, so I think we've covered our safety. Remember, use eye protection, use protection on your hands when you're dealing with it, and please go to the cafeteria. When, you, when you're done there, we have some amazing things where we're going to duplicate a Nobel Prize experiment. Uh, I'm Mike Coffey. I'm the president of Cryomagnetics over in Oak Ridge. Uh, I actually went to high school in Oak Ridge and graduated there, did my bachelor's at, at University of Tennessee and then uh, grad school at Michigan. Uh, I worked for AT&T Bell Labs for a while and then came back to start Cryomagnetics over here in Oak Ridge. Uh, and we get to, to play with these superconductors every day and, uh, and it is, it's a lot of fun. Uh, Obviously, the guys at ORNL are having a good time with developing these new superconductors, but we get to put them into practical application, and, uh, and, and it is interesting. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what, we, what we're doing there. Um, I guess I, I tend to put this up there sometimes just uh, for people who don't normally work in cryogenics. There's a big difference between cryogenics and cryonics. I don't know if you've ever heard of cryonics before, but that's where they actually freeze human beings. Uh, if they think maybe science will catch up with whatever is killing them, uh, just as they die, uh, they, they can be frozen. Uh, I guess there are uh, some famous baseball players, and in fact, I think Walt Disney, there's a rumor Walt Disney had, was frozen like that. But uh, 
it's, it's kind of a wacky science, if you want to call it that, but it's certainly not what we do at cryomagnetics. But there are people that, in fact, do freeze, freeze human beings uh, in, a, in a few places around the company. No, no, they wait until, until they have just died and then they, they freeze them. And they're, I guess they think that someday maybe the science will be there that will be able to bring them back to life and be able to cure them. But uh, the reality is that that really isn't going to happen. <laughs> so it's, it's, we, we, we try to distinguish ourselves from people who are doing that kind of thing. Uh, this is a, a picture of our building. We, have, we are a small company. We've got about 50 people here in Oak Ridge. Uh, about uh, a quarter to a third of it of the company is engineers and technicians that are that are working with designing superconducting magnets and uh, the cryogenic systems, working with the superconductors. Uh, we also have a, a small group that we bought a few years ago over in France that's working at extremely low temperatures. So, liquid nitrogen that you were just working with is down at 77 degrees above absolute zero. Uh, these liquid helium that most low temperature superconductors operate at is down uh, at four degrees above, above absolute zero at liquid helium temperature. But these guys at, at cryoconcept over in France actually make systems that go down to 0 0.01 degrees above absolute zero. And there is some interesting science that can be done, a lot of interesting science that can be done down at that level too. In particular, the quantum computers uh, nano device development, things like that that are, that are going on these days uh, need to be done down at those extremely low temperatures. Uh, so that's just kind of a summary with a lot of different types of, of magnets. Uh, I'm going to go straight into to more just some of the fun applications that we get to do with the, the magnets that we design and build. Uh, one of the most exciting ones these days, applications these days, is I don't know if you've seen ads on TV recently for uh, the ProVision Healthcare Center here in Knoxville. Uh, they're bringing in a new proton therapy uh, cancer treatment facility there in, in Knoxville. And it's one of very, very few anywhere. I think there are only three in the U.S. and uh, a handful all over the world. But we're working with, with ProVision and ProNova in particular uh, to uh, bring this, the next generation of this proton therapy uh, to, we're, we're trying to make it less expensive, less complicated to install so a lot of hospitals can afford it and can, can get, it, get this, this new treatment uh, available more widely. What proton therapy does is if you have a tumor, a cancer tumor or something that's in, deep inside the brain or prostate or something like that, protons can be used to, to treat that tumor by uh, firing a proton beam at the, the tumor. It's similar to what, what might happen if you're trying to, to do treatment with x-rays on a, a cancer treatment, but x-rays have a, uh, a downside to them in that they damage all of the, all of the material, all the tissue that they hit in their beam path. Protons actually go through uh, the, the outer sections and then deposit their energy just at the tumor thing. So they, they can be used in very delicate places near an optic nerve or something like that without damaging other, other parts of, of the brain or of, of the body. So protons though, proton beams are charged particle beams. So it's just a positive ion uh, beam. And because uh, it's a, a, a flowing uh, charged particle, it can be bent in a magnetic field. If you put it in a magnetic field, it'll bend one way or the other and, and interact with that magnetic field. So uh, this is actually a picture of, of their treatment uh, system. But if you look at, the, at how the system is put together, it actually consists of a, a, a cyclotron that generates this proton beam. Uh, the proton beam comes down and can either be split to one of two treatment rooms uh, it goes through some, some small room temperature magnets that will, will get it over to the start of the system. These pieces that are in blue are what we're developing, the superconducting magnets we're developing. So the, uh, there are two of these magnets, one here and one here, that will allow, by, by using superconductors for those magnets, we can make a very high field. We can bend this beam very precisely and very sharply. And can, and can precisely direct it over into the, the patient treatment room. 
So this is a very difficult uh, kind of a magnet that we're working on and, uh, and, and we hope to have all those up and running and working within the next year. Uh, we do, uh, and other magnets in the, the medical field, that we do, I, I, I'm sure everyone is familiar with MRI magnets that are used for, for imaging of the, the human body. We don't make the big magnets that are large enough for a whole human body, but we do make systems that are for preclinical uh, MRI imaging. So these are ones that can be used to do cancer research, for instance, using uh, rats or mice and, and things like that. Uh, so some of these small systems like we show here, these are, are some of the, the images of a, of a, in fact it's a live rat that they're uh, studying in this particular case. So they can, they bring in little life support nozzle to defeat it oxygen while it's in there, sedated inside the magnet and, and, uh, and they can actually watch in real time the heart beating and, and everything. It's a, it's a really fascinating area. So, so these magnets we, uh, we developed over, over at Cryomagnetics and built also, and we're doing a number of those these days. Uh, there are a lot of magnet applications, superconducting magnet applications in high energy physics. Uh, this is one of the, the, the biggest projects that we've been involved with. Uh, it's a project that's actually over in Germany, installed in Karlsruhe, Germany. Uh, and they are doing research that's way over my head uh, in, in physics on looking at neutrinos and, and, uh, and searching for how they interact with material. This is a, a system that they've put in over in Germany. This, there's a beam, that come, a charged particle beam that comes through this system too. And these are all magnet systems down through here that are used for shaping the, magnetic, uh, shaping the beam and, and directing it. And then this is a, a large detection chamber that, that's at the end of that particle beam. Well, cryomagnetics made the magnet that's right at the front nose of this chamber and right at the tail end of that chamber. Uh, and right now we're in the final testing stages at cryomagnetics of, of making six magnets that are in this, this red section right here. So uh, very interesting magnets. This is actually a picture of the, uh, the spectrometer chamber that you see here as they were bringing it into the town in Germany where it was going to, to be installed. It uh, gives you a little appreciation for the scale of the, the size of the project. It's a, it's a huge thing. This, this, in fact, this chamber was only built, I think, about 30 miles away from where they wanted to install it, but it was impossible to bring it by road, so they ended up having to take it over to, to the ocean bring it around through uh, through the Atlantic, up into the Mediterranean, and back up through by water, and then through this town just to get it to its installation site. So it was, a, it was quite a challenge for them. Uh, these are the, the two magnets that we, that we have on the two ends of it. This is just showing a technician that's down inside that chamber as they were going through the, uh, the, the installation of it. So the, these are what we're we're designing and building though uh, and we work with the scientists that are at these labs. A lot of the science they're doing is actually over our heads, frankly. Uh, we do have a, a number of physicists and, and engineers that, that work at cryomagnetics but, but the science gets very deep uh, on, on some of these applications. We have also done work with NASA. Uh, this is a picture of a, a magnet that we made for them. Uh, I guess in the late 80s, early 90s, I guess it was. Uh, and in fact, that's a picture of the rocket that it was launched on. Uh, so it, we were the first ones to have a superconducting magnet that was, was actually put into outer space. Uh, it was part of a detector array. They're, they're using the magnet and some special materials in the high field region of the magnet to, to cool some detectors down to very, very low temperatures and get uh, very high resolution uh, images from deep space. Uh, so it's, it was kind of like a next generation Hubble uh, telescope kind of a project. Uh, we've also done some interesting spectrometer uh, applications for, uh, for other people. This was a, a system that we made uh, in a joint project between the University of Michigan and Indiana University and uh, I think NASA was actually involved in this one too. But our magnet is actually inside the white part, uh, the gondola of, of this hot, uh, balloon, so it's right down in this part. 
and they they uh, launch this the system with a with a helium balloon and it goes up to I think about 150,000 feet so it's essentially a low earth orbit uh, kind of a height and they, they were looking for antimatter in fact uh, that can't penetrate the earth's atmosphere so they get up very high so where they can still see some of these particles that may come in from deep space uh, very interesting project because they wanted to be able to launch this magnet up to, to high altitude where there's no atmosphere so you go from uh, atmospheric pressure to essentially a vacuum uh, very close to a vacuum and at high altitude uh, you, you, we didn't want to lose all the liquid helium that was in the system at the time we needed it to be safe when they're done with the uh, with the study at high altitude uh, what they do is actually collapse they blow a hole in fact in the in the balloon and let the thing free fall back down to earth and when it gets down near the ground they, they open a parachute so and and then let it let it come down more softly to to earth the first one of the flights they did with this was in Canada and everything went really well they got a lot of interesting science out of it it took uh, about two weeks I think of a flight later they they also took it up to and down to Antarctica and did a flight down there and I think they actually ran into some problems down there with that one. They, they let it free fall to earth and they had a, a problem with the parachute so it hit hard and uh, but it actually survived it. It ended up sitting in a snowbank for uh, in fact I think for a year or so before they went back and found it and, and they're still using it now. So it's, it's, it's fun work because you get to work with all these scientists who have really bizarre interesting ideas and you know what they do is come to cryomagnetics and they say you know how can you do a superconducting magnet that will 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 work with this science and it ends up being quite a collaboration on all these projects uh, let's see this was also another interesting project that we did actually with the uh, with the US Air Force uh, and and with Raytheon Corporation uh, I don't know if any of you yeah, prob probably nobody saw it, but a few years ago there was a segment, in fact, on, on 60 Minutes about this, this device that had been developed. So uh, there's a, a company that we partnered with in California that can build uh, what's called a gyrotron. And this is something that uses a very high magnetic field, so that's where our superconducting magnet came into play. Um, but then they can uh, generate a very high intensity electron beam and they found that they can, uh, if you direct this at, say, a person, and it hits on your skin, this electron beam, uh, it will only penetrate about a 64th of an inch deep. And it, it can cause extreme pain. But when it's, the beam is turned off, there's no damage at all done to your skin. So. Uh, the military decided this was a pretty cool way to, to keep somebody from attacking a border crossing or attacking a nuclear installation facility or something like that. Or they've actually found they can, can scan the beam and, and disperse a crowd. Sure. Yeah, well, they can they can fire it at somebody long enough to get them to run away is the main objective of it. And this thing is accurate at uh, up to about a mile of a distance, so uh, they can it can can keep people away even even out of gunshot range. So, uh, kind of interestingly, this project hasn't gone very far because uh, because it doesn't kill people. Um, the military found that everybody was the, the the press thought it was going to be giving everybody cancer or or you know what happens if it hits somebody in the eye or something like that and actually they did a lot of these studies and found that there were no adverse effects to it but once the press got a hold of it it uh, it essentially knocked the project down to something that's very small unfortunately now can we connect to this sure yeah we have a uh, electrical the R resistance versus temperature uh, experiment working now it looks like and so one of the applications they they thought that uh, that beam that ray gun it got termed a ray gun because of uh, how it was invisible but it would make people disperse 
Uh, they, they thought it would be good for, uh, for keeping uh, terrorists from attacking uh, pipelines and things like that too, and uh, nuclear power plants. Okay, so what we have here is a, uh, one of the superconductors just like you were using in the, the other room, and we have it in, in this, doer, or this uh, cooler with liquid nitrogen. It's very slowly cooling down, and you can see the resistance on the, the vertical scale. And as it cooled down from 110 Kelvin down at about 80 degrees Kelvin, you can see all of a sudden the resistance just started falling very quickly all the way down to the, the, the lowest measurement that the, the instrument can read. So all we have in this, this, this test, this measurement, is a disk of the, of the YBCO, I think it is, on this one. Uh, and we, we have a temperature sensor mounted on that, so that's what's giving us the temperature on the bottom. And we have a, we're passing a current through, through that superconductor and just looking at the voltage across it so we can see what, what kind of resistance the material has. And so now it's actually going to zero. So that's a, that's a live demonstration of seeing the resistance running to zero. Here there was some thermal lag in the thermal couple, otherwise we would have seen it go way down. Yeah. So maybe we, sh we need to move on now to the next presentation. Yeah. And this is going to be given by Athena. And she's going to talk to you about how we're searching for new superconductors, not the superconductors that we know. Okay, well, good morning, everybody. How are we? Good? Okay. Well, my name is Athena Safat. I'm a scientist at Oak Ridge National Lab. I've been at Oak Ridge for the past six years. Um, so which one of you would like to um, get in science and be scientists? Anybody? That's great, that's great. I can tell you that it's wonderful because I show up every day to work. I do experiments and I read and I learn and I get paid for it. So I would absolutely recommend that you do that as well. So today we're going to talk about discovering new superconductors. Um, okay, so why do we care about superconductors? As it's been mentioned many times today, um, they uh, conduct electricity superbly, right? So we have semiconductors, they only can carry so much current. We have conductors like your copper and your silver, and they can pass electrons um, very readily. And then you've got superconductors, right? So no resistance, a lot of conductivity, and that's great for applications. OK, so again, why superconductors? So compared to your copper uh, household wire, right? We can carry so much current density through a wire. It's about five amps per millimeter cross section of a wire, okay? For a superconductor, and all of these are superconductors, you see they can carry a lot more current compared to your copper. So in that sense, it's great for applications. For example, I can use them in um, magnets. So this is a superconducting based magnet compared to your copper-based magnet, it's a lot smaller. I can make the wires a lot smaller, and they will carry a lot more current anyway. So I'm bringing that down the size of the magnet, OK? So, hence, it's a lot lighter. It's high performance. I can use them in um, generators and windmills, for example. Um, so uh, Mike mentioned MRI machines. We can have open sky MRI machines so you don't have to get stuck in that gigantic MRI magnet anymore. So higher performance superconducting wires can do that. They can generate huge amounts of magnetic field. So yes, so generator applications and also transmission lines, as Amit mentioned this morning. So I can replace my over, uh, overhead transmission lines by something underground that would take a lot less space. So OK, so we do care about superconductors. So why do we care about making materials? Well, both classes of high temperature superconductors were discovered by chemists. And by that, I mean those that can make their own materials. 
So co copper base, copper oxide base, also known as cuprates, were discovered by these two gentlemen, as uh, Amit mentioned this morning, in 1986. The iron-based superconductors recently, in 2008, was discovered by Hozono in Japan, Tokyo. So one materials, again, if you can make the material that you want, you can pursue the science that appeals to you, right? So for example, you can make superconductors, batteries, semiconductors, and you can play with them. If you can make them, you can study their science. Just like if you know how to cook, you can create what you want, right? So on the left, you can create this. You can put hamburgers on a pizza, right? Who would like that? <laughs> yeah, see? <laughs> That's what I'm talking about, right? You can make your own uh, seafood stew which w with whatever combinations of seafood that you want, literally, right? So again, if you know how to cook, if you know how to make materials, then you can do the science that appeals to you. Okay. I'd like to show you quickly um, materials pyramid. So this is a pyramid, right? So every day, a lot of scientists like myself discover new materials. But not a lot of them are useful, OK? So at the very top of the pyramid, this is where we give it out to industry, OK? So we make a lot of materials. So this is the width of the pyramid. But if they're interesting, they start moving up the pyramid. And eventually, they become useful, and they go out into you know, again, windmills, they go out into cars, they go out into batteries, whatnot. So a lot of discoveries are made every day, but again, we need to make sure that the material is interesting. And if it is interesting, we move it up the pyramid and we study it further, right? And we fine tune the properties. Um, so crystals are important. Um, Crystals are important because they have regular arrangement of atoms, OK? So these balls are, uh, are just atoms I'm representing here. So you can look at a cornfield. You see how it's just ordered, right? We have lines of these bushes of corn. Um, a polycrystalline sample is something that's made up of crystalline regions on the micrometer region. You see, but there are grain boundaries. For my type of research, we care about single crystals, OK? So single crystals are like your jewelry. They're very expensive, right? They're very expensive because they have an ordered atomic arrangement. So they're very good for aesthetics, of course, crystals, right? We buy them every day. But they're also used in devices, like semiconducting <coughs> devices, um, optics. Um, so they are important. And for my type of research, we make a lot of single crystalline materials. So they're very mirror-like on, on the surface. You see I'm, I'm making a reflection of this penny onto the single crystal. And uh, they, they, they tell me the intrinsic properties, so what the material should be really about, not looking at uh, grain boundaries, not looking at uh, impurities, right? So we care about single crystals. OK, so that's all great and wonderful. So where do we start exactly? We start from the periodic table. Who knows the periodic table? Almost everybody. I love it. OK. So what's the first group called? Anybody? Alkali metals. Very good. Thank you. So this first group is called alkali metals. Um, they're very, very reactive, for example, with water. In fact, they aggressively react with water to produce hydroxides. They're very low density. They have very low melting points. So the next group next to them, as you all know, is alkali earth metals. The first two groups you cannot find in nature. And the reason is because, again, they react very aggressively with water and they form hydroxides. They can also react aggressively with halogens and form ionic salts. OK, then we have transition metals, right, where you have the D electrons, right, or the MTD shell. Um, you've got the halogens over here, which are very electronegative, right, and very reactive. You've got the noble gases like helium, helium balloons, right? Um, so they're odorless, they're colorless, they're non-flammable, they're just you know, uh, your non-reactive gases. You've got lanthanides, which are down here, right? <coughs> they're the F block of electrons. And then actinides, which are all the way down here. They're mainly man-made. All of them are radioactive. So looking at the periodic table, 
These are the ones that I don't want to worry about. Noble gases I don't care for, and anything that's radioactive. So basically, whatever that I've blocked off as black, I'm not going to worry about. The rest of the elements are the ones that I can play with in a chemistry lab, OK? So great and wonderful. So what else is needed for making materials? You need to know your general chemistry, right? So you need to know your elements, reactivity, toxicity, general properties. For example, I'm showing calcium, strontium, barium here. So as we mentioned, they're very radio, uh, uh, reactive in air. So they have to be sealed in glasses. In fact, when we buy them, that's what they come in. They either, they're either embedded in some sort of an oil, like a kerosene oil, to avoid oxidation, or they're completely sealed in a glass. Okay, so they're, they're uh, in a vacuum. Okay, so they're highly reactive. You have to know how to um, open and actually use these elements, right? So it would be nice to know what the melting temperature of the various elements are, what the boiling point of the different elements are. Um, what else do you need to know? You need to know your safety um, uh, sheets. So on all sorts of elements that you can buy, there are uh, safety guidelines. You have to read the bottles very carefully. For example, um, iron, it's non-hazardous. Um, barium pieces, it irritates skin and eye. Um, for arsenic, it says cancer hazard. So yes, we work in a chemistry lab, and we're knowledgeable about what we're playing with, but you have to be very careful, because a lot of these things can get you very sick. So in this case, cobalt uh, powder, it says flammable. So you need to know what you're doing in a, in a chemistry lab. You can read entertaining books, OK? And I recommend two of them if you have time to pick them up. One is called The Element of Murder, and it lists a bunch of elements that are really toxic. And it's got uh, interesting stories. There is another one called The 13th Element, and it talks about phosphorus. So those would be entertaining books for you, scientists, future scientists, to read. Um, what else? You need to learn about phase diagrams. OK, so elements by themselves have a certain reactivity, right? But if I put them together with another element, so for example, this is a phase diagram of silver with barium, you, the properties change tremendously depending on the composition, right? So we have these islands of liquid, uh, areas of solid, and you need to know what kind of um, compounds you can form between silver and barium. OK, so know your phase diagrams. What else do I need to know? I need to learn about crystal structures, OK, if you want to make materials. So certain elements can arrange in a certain format. Um, what else? There are a lot of preparation methods, OK, just like cooking. There are certain temperatures that we need to use. There are certain variables that we need to change to make materials, for example, from a vapor state, from a solid state, from a melt, from a solution. So for example, iron-based superconductors were mainly grown using a certain way, and cuprates, um, the colors are not really showing up here. They're, they're made a certain way. Um, what else? Um, you need to know how to confine your reactions. So just like in the kitchen, you've got to know what pots and pans to use right, for a certain thing. And this is very important, so certain elements for certain elements, you need to use certain containers and tube choices, OK? And you also need to know what maximum operating temperature for that dish is. For example, I can't use a plastic dish and put it in the oven. Otherwise, it's going to melt, right? So you need to know what kind of dish to use, in a sense, to put your elements in it. In my lab, we use a lot of alumina. It has a maximum operating temperature of 1,900 degrees Celsius and it's very high in Fahrenheit, you see? So we cook a pizza at about 400, right? So we're talking a lot of temperature, right? And with a lot of reactions that we do, they're very air sensitive. So you have to seal them in a glass, which is called silica. It melts at around this much Fahrenheit. That's very high. And we actually do a lot of melting of the glass in my lab, too, just to confine reactions. So and as an example, this is how it works. I want to make this superconductor, right? Do we know how to f uh, form uh, like molar ratios of elements with an, yes? OK, very good. So I want to make this. So I start with binaries of lanthanum arsenide, cobalt oxide, iron oxide, iron. I balance this out. I figure out how much of this mass I need, right? And then I go back and I weigh these things out. So weigh carefully. 
Then you put it in a dish and you put it in a glass and a very, very um, courageous um, and uh, risk taker postdoc will get in the lab and seal it at very high temperatures and again, very, very high temperatures, you've got to melt the glass. So we do this on a daily basis. So our reaction is in here, it's in a vacuum form, right? No air, there's a pump out here somewhere. And then you seal the reaction in a glass and then of course you need an oven to cook your materials, right? And that's a picture of an oven. So this is the materials lab at Oak Ridge National Lab. If you walk into, into one of our labs, this is what it looks like. You've got lots of elements, lots of binaries, in cabinets, in drawers, in glove boxes if they're air sensitive. Um, so that brings me to our superconductivity research. So this is what I do every day. So I get in the lab and I decide on a crystal structure. So this is an arrangement of atoms in a unit cell. I decide on this, then I figure out what kind of synthesis methods I'm going to use to make it, and then we characterize it, okay? So sometimes we have to modify the crystal structure, remake the material in order to get better properties. So we go around and around this loop many times over. Um, so we can, we can encounter various obstacles when it comes to synthesis and also modifying this in order to get a good property out of a superconductor or a higher transition temperature. Um, but the hope is again to make superconducting wires, which Amit and Mike talked about, um, for industry. So we want to move to the top of that pyramid, right? Okay, just as a slide to show you the structures of Superconductors are very, very complex, okay? They're not just atoms, but a specific arrangement of atoms. On the left, I have the cuprates here in red, and iron-based materials are on the right. So they're very, very complex. They're multi-elements, cer certain arrangements. Um, um, various species are shown here. Okay, so concluding remarks, you can discover, design the material that allow you to pursue the specific science that interests you. So it is, interest, it is very important to be able to make your own materials. Okay, so materials preparation can be unpredictable, so the discovery of new materials may be unexpectedly, okay. Um, my hope is for you guys to get in a synthesis lab and attempt making, making materials from uh, unit cells up in a sense. So we literally design this um, or think about making this type of a material on a nanometer scale, an inch is shown here, and then we want to make something like you played with, right? Something that you can actually touch, something that you can put contacts on, something that you can do an experiment on. So we think of this, but we actually need to make something that's on a centimeter, right? So we can see it visibly and do experiments on it. So this is sort of our job, or part of our job at Oak Ridge National Lab. And I hope that you can come and visit us at Oak Ridge National Lab, okay? That's it. Any questions? so much about superconductors, and I told you that these high temperature superconductors that you played with in your student project, that you were doing levitation and suspension with, we do not know how they work. And so Thomas is not going to tell you what are the possible candidates for theories that may, in, in terms that you can understand of what may be the leading candidates to explain um, how these materials work, and when one, one of those topics is is, um, is agreed upon by all physicists, it will change physics as we know it. So he's going to say a few words about that now, and after that you will be um, uh, seeing how you can make ice cream almost instantaneously with liquid nitrogen that you play with, and then you get the course. Of course, that's the whole purpose, right? Okay, so we already know that a lot of you guys want to get into science, but how many of you want to get into theory? <laughs> ah. That's what I, you, okay, that's very good. That's what I kind of expected, so I should have sabotaged some of these experiments. But um, 
theory can actually be, uh, be very exciting. You can also make a lot of money with theory, so you should uh, stick around. And of course, then there is ice cream. So I'm, I'm Thomas Meyer, and I'm going to tell you how superconductivity works in some of these materials. And I'm going to tell you about possible candidates for a theory for these new superconductors, the type you just handled in these uh, projects. So I'm going to start out with a little uh, uh, video uh, that uh, illustrates the basics again of a superconductor. And I don't know if we have um, audio here. I think it's just music. OK. All right. OK. I'm just going to be talking to it. So what you're seeing here, these people um, are the electrons in a material. So as you know, a material, as you've just heard, is made up of atoms. These atoms give up some of the electrons, which then flow around like a gas in this material. Uh, and in metals, uh, these electrons uh, behave almost independently. They flow around independently, minding their own business, just like these people here. And in reality, they also bump into imperfections in this crystal. They also bump into vibrations of the ions, and that's what gives rise to uh, resistance. Uh, you didn't really see that here, probably because of safety reasons. We don't want to have people bump into each other. So but what's going on here is now we cooled down the material below its superconducting transition. It's below TC. And this is where really magic happens. Electrons, just as these dances here, start to uh, form pairs, what we call Cooper pairs. Uh, and as we cool it down, more and more of these pairs form. They don't have to be close together. In fact, in the real materials, they're quite far apart. Um, but as we cool it down further, we get more and more of these pairs. Um, and this is what's going on in a superconductor. Um, and eventually, what really makes this material superconducting is that these Cooper pairs now they figure out that they can lower the overall energy of the system by synchronizing their movement. So they all move together as one big entity. And this one big entity is not affected anymore by scattering. Uh, that's because um, you would have to break up the synchronization, and that would cost energy. So if the scattering cannot provide this energy, it doesn't happen. And so these uh, synchronized Cooper pairs can now flow th uh, through the material without any resistance. So this is why, as you've seen before in this little experiment, the resistance dropped to absolute zero. Uh, and this is what you're seeing here. They're all synchronized now. Uh, and once you initiate a current in this system, uh, it can flow forever. OK. So the big question, of course, is these are electrons. They have a negative charge. And as you know, negative charges repel. So why in the world would these electrons form pairs? Um, and here is everything you wanted to know about why this happens. Uh, and this applies to the low temperature superconductors. So, so not the type of materials you've just handled. These are different. Uh, and this is what's going on there. So here we have. Our metal ions, they have a positive charge. Here's our friend, the electron. Uh, electron moves into this position here. Because it has a negative charge, it attracts uh, the ions. They shift their position. The electron now keeps moving. Uh, a second electron now becomes attracted by, these, by this net positive charge and moves into the position where the, where the first electron was before. and so. Uh, this leads to the attraction between these two electrons. So you now you see this attractive interaction is actually local in space. The second electron moved right there where the first one was. But it's delayed, or in other words, retarded in time. Uh, and that's important because these two electrons, since they have a negative charge, they repel each other. You don't want to pair them at the same uh, place in space and not at the same time. So what's happening here, they do pair. Uh, uh, locally in space, but the pairing is delayed in time, and this is why it works. But also from that, you can predict from the theory that the, the maximum transition temperature you can get from such a system is quite small. It's much smaller than the 
what's called the Debye frequency. That's the frequency with which these metal ions vibrate in these systems. So there's a limit on the transition temperature you can get out of this. And so these low temperature superconductors are completely understood. Uh, and it's because of these three gentlemen here, John Bardeen, Leon Cooper, and Bob Schriever, three guys from Illinois. They solved the problem in the 50s. Uh, um, and in fact, everything was consistent with their theory. For example, what I just mentioned, there's a maximum TC you can get from from this mechanism, and all the materials in this class which obey this theory, they indeed uh, don't have transition temperatures that are larger than this limit. But we, so we understand these materials, we know that it's the ion vibrations that cause the electron uh, pair formations, and so this is solved. But then of course the revolution happened in, in, in the 80s. Um, high temperature superconductors were discovered, uh, TC skyrocketed up to very high values. This is why the experiments you just did work, because they have transition temperatures that are higher than liquid nitrogen, so it's easy to cool them down. Um, and you see they have TC's transition temperatures that are much higher than this limit that you can predict from theory. So that already tells you that Ion vibrations do not play a role in superconductivity in these systems. And indeed, that's the case. We now know that it's not the iron vibrations uh, that lead to the electron pair formation. So we don't know what causes the electrons to pair. Uh, and again, well, if you want to become a theorist and you solve this question, you very likely will be a rich man because you're going to get the Nobel Prize. So, it's an exciting business to be in, really. Uh, and the big question, of course, is again, why do electrons form Cooper pairs in these high temperature superconductors? Everything I supply, you still have electrons. These electrons form pairs below the transition temperatures. These pairs become coherent. This is why you get superconductivity. But what we don't know is why do they form pairs if it's not because of the ion vibrations? Um, why is this such a hard question? Why? Well, because these systems are extremely complex. If we go back to the low temperature superconductors, we understand their normal state. Before they become superconducting, we understand the state they're in. The electrons in these systems behave just like electrons. But well, that's unfortunately not the case in the high temperature superconductors. They uh, exhibit very strange behavior. The electrons in these systems don't at all behave like electrons. They do all kinds of weird things, but that's also what makes them extremely interesting. Uh, so Steve Kivelson, uh, an important researcher in this field, once said that if one looks hard enough, one can find in the cuprates, that's a high temperature superconductor, something that is reminiscent of almost any interesting phenomenon in solid state physics. So th these things are not just interesting because they become superconducting, uh, but also because they do very strange uh, things before they become superconducting. As a result of that, there have been many theories proposed. Every researcher almost has its own uh, theory uh, for this, uh, but uh, luckily most of them so far have been refuted by experiments. So it's not as bad as it sounds, but here is just a small list certainly incomplete uh, for theories that have been pro pro proposed for high TC, for this high TC problem. And these have been proposed not just by s some random people. All these guys here have in common, they're all geniuses. They all got the Nobel Prize and they all worked in this field uh, and tried to come up with a the theory. So far they've all failed. So it's not an easy problem. Here's an example of one failed uh, uh, theory this is Phil Anderson. He's not just a random guy. He is very important. Uh, he's a big shot. He got the Nobel Prize in 77, I believe. Uh, and he came up in the late 90s with a, with a theory called the inner layer tunneling mechanism. And so he wrote a book about it. He was so sure that that's what's really going on. He wrote the book about it. You can buy it. But a few years later, a group in, in the Netherlands came up with an experiment that tested this theory. They wrote a paper and they concluded that in the high temperature superconductor, uh, measurements provide evidence for a discrepancy of at least an order of magnitude uh, with deductions based on the interlayer tunneling model. But that's just a nice way of saying that 
this theory is wrong. So here it is. You can still buy the book, but be advised that what you read in it might not be true. OK, so instead of going through all these theories, uh, which of course uh, there is no time for that, I'm just going to focus on one. It's the spin fluctuation theory. That's one of the leading contenders that hasn't been refuted by experiments yet. It, I'm also a bit biased because the computations we perform at Oak Ridge uh, are consistent with this kind of theory. So this is what I'm going to talk about. I just want to give you some idea of how you can get pairing in a system uh, where you don't have these ion vibrations. Um, so to proceed, we're going to focus. So this is a high temperature superconductor, typically crystal structure. You've just seen it. Uh, what we do know about these systems is that superconductivity happens in these two-dimensional copper oxygen layers. So here we have copper atoms, the brown atoms here separated by the oxygen atoms. Uh, and what we know is the electrons in these layers, those are the ones which become superconducting. Now, in order to go on, you have to know one thing. that it's An electron has not only a charge, but it also has a spin. Has anybody heard about the spin of an electron? Very good. So this spin is like a little magnetic moment. And the magnets, you know, the magnetism actually comes from this spin. What happens in those magnets is all these spins align in the same direction. They all point up or they all point down. Now, in these high temperature superconductors, the opposite happens. Uh, this is what's called antiferromagnetism. There you have the spins of the electrons on neighboring atoms pointing in opposite direction, up, down, up, down, up, down. OK. Now, in order to have an electric current, we need to take some of these electrons out. We need to dope the system with holes. So this is just, we took one electron out. So it's the same as saying we doped the hole into the system. So now let's see what happens if we let this hole move around. Well, it's moving to the right. And as it's doing that, um, it breaks these nice antiferromagnetic bonds that, that we have. See, now we don't have up, down, up, down, but instead we have up, 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 up. So the hole creates a wake in the spin density, very similar to, to the low temperature superconductors where an electron creates a wake in the metal ion grid. So here we have a wake in the spin density, and this wake in the spin density now actually attracts a second uh, hole. Uh, which then moves towards the first hole. And as it does that, it restores this antiferromagnetic arrangement of the spin. So it can actually lower the overall energy of the system by pairing up uh, with this first hole. So this is how you can get two electrons to pair in these type of systems where magnetism plays uh, uh, an important role. OK, how do we know we're on the right track? I think for the uh, sake of time, I'm going to just put this slide up. Um, I've shown you before that all these systems that are in this class of high temperature superconductors have very different transition temperatures. You go all the way down here from 30 Kelvin up to 130, sometimes 150 Kelvin. So it's a huge range of transition temperatures. Well, why is that? We don't have a clue. We don't know. So if we can if we come up with this theory, this theory should really should be able to explain why some of these materials uh, become superconducting only at these temperatures, while others become superconducting uh, at much higher temperatures. Or, well, we're all dreamers, uh, so what we really want is a theory that provides a blueprint, a recipe for how to make a room temperature superconductor. Then we can say, Athena, grow this system. And uh, we're all done. All right. Thank you. Now the part that you guys are all been waiting for. That's pretty nice. I'm going to show you how you can make instant ice cream with liquid nitrogen. And he's going to explain how what he's doing. Of course. Exactly. So it's hard to believe that it, that's actually true. My name actually what? is. <laughs> Gene Ice. So, uh, so you're going to get this demonstration of how to make uh, instant liquid nitrogen ice cream from Dr. Ice. So uh, this is very simple. So you've heard about 
Super Sonic Hindi. What is Super Sonic Hindi? It's a change in the properties of material. Like gravity. Moon called that a phase change. Well, you're familiar with phase changes. You see, water that turns into ice when it's cold. Water turns into ice when it gets cold. It turns into steam when it gets hot. But ice cream is a mixture of many different uh, items. It has milk in it, it has butter, uh, it has sugar, it has uh, vanilla, and we're going to turn that in this mixture, which is a liquid right now, into, do you see it? Into instant ice cream. And once we do this, we'll go outside, we'll go out into the lobby, and we'll be making more ice cream there. But we just wanted to, to do this for you in front of the uh, entire audience. So I'm going to pour a little bit of liquid nitrogen in here. And what's it trying to do? It's trying to come to thermal equilibrium. So the ice cream, the ice cream mix has a certain uh, inertia to changing temperature. And the, the, new, the uh, nitrogen that we put in there is trying to cool it down. So the, the ice cream mix is making the, it is boiling off the liquid nitrogen but the liquid nitrogen is also cooling down the ice cream. And it's already turned into ice cream. So we're going to go out the door and in the lobby. Wait, not yet. What? <laughs> not yet. <laughs> OK, guys, so thank you all for coming. Like um, Dr. I said, we're going to have some ice cream for you out in the lobby, and you can get a little closer look at how they're making it. Um, and also, we have surveys to fill out. There's people handing them out, out there as well. If you can fill this out, that gives us an idea of how you like today, what do you want to see different in the future. Um, so I really appreciate it if you guys can fill this out. Um, let's give our team a hand. We want to thank West High School for giving us this, this venue to do this. And I'd like to thank the people from World Cricket Associated University, Julie Abbott, and Moy Pua, and Murray Westfall for, for organizing this event. And, for a great job and the next three as well. So attend those. So now if you can walk out in an orderly fashion, just like that, <laughs> and walk towards the ice cream tables.